All right, welcome everyone. We're going to go ahead and get started here. Thank you so much for joining today's webinar sponsored by the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, also known by its acronym AHRQ. This is Gabrielle Weber with AHRQ's EvidenceNow Technical Assistance Center, and I'll be the moderator for today's session on creating a learning healthcare system, the role of practice facilitators in primary care. Before we get underway, let's review a few quick housekeeping items for today's webinar. All participants' audio lines are muted to reduce noise interference, so if you're experiencing any technical issues, you can send a message directly to the webinar host using the chat window in your webinar console. Please make sure to select the host, which should be listed as TAC team so you can send your message directly, um, and that will be in the drop-down menu of participants when you send your chat. Throughout the webinar, if you have questions about the content being covered, please submit those through the Q&A window in your WebEx console. We should have some time at the end of the webinar for a brief Q&A, and we can read out your questions during that time. Lastly, today's webinar will be recorded and made available for download along with the presentation slides on the ahrq.gov website. And with that, I'm going to go turn things over to Bob McNellis, Senior Advisor for Primary Care at the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality to get us started with today's presentation. Over to you, Bob. Great. Thanks so much, Gabrielle. I appreciate it. And thanks to all of you for joining us today for this, our second annual public webinar about our Evidence Now initiative. We've got a great program lined up for you today, and I'm really excited to hear from our speakers. So let's get it rolling. Next slide there, Gabrielle. Uh, you can see what we have an ambitious agenda for today, and I'm going to start with some introductory remarks to set the stage for our three main speakers. But before I set the stage, let me introduce you to our speakers. First up will be Lindy Knox. Dr. Lindy Knox is founding director of LANET, a primary care practice-based research and resource network in LA County that supports practice-based clinician-led research, evidence translation, and practice improvement transformation in the safety net. Lindy has worked as a clinical psychologist in healthcare and school environments in Texas and was an associate professor of family medicine at the University of Southern California. Lindy will be followed by Anne Lefebvre. Anne is an associate director of the North Carolina Area Health Education Resource Centers Program, or AHECS, and the director of uh, Practice Support Services, which provides practice coaching to more than 1,300 community-based practices across North Carolina. Anne received her Master of Social Work from East Carolina University and has almost 20 years of experience in the field of quality improvement. Stephanie Kirshner will bring us home. Stephanie began her work as a practice facilitator in 2006, supporting practices and patient-centered medical home efforts. She now leads uh, the practice facilitators across multiple initiatives supported by the Colorado Health Extension System and the University of Colorado Department of Family Medicine in primary care and specialty practices in Colorado. Now, if we do this right, not only will you hear lots of great insights from our speakers, but we'll have about 10 minutes or so for your questions at the very end. So next slide, please, Gabrielle. So the purpose of today's webinar, what has brought us all together, is to describe what a learning healthcare system is or can be, its importance as a building block um, for primary care transformation. We're also going to try to describe how practice facilitators build capacity for learning and quality improvement and the effects on primary care culture. And lastly, we're going to try to highlight evidence now as just one model for creating a learning healthcare system. And you can see we're going to try to accomplish a lot in a short period of time, and my job at the start will be to tell you a little bit about evidence now, a little bit about practice facilitation, and just a little bit about learning healthcare systems, all in 10 minutes or less. So buckle up. Next slide. Well, first let me say a few words about evidence now, which is a large grant initiative funded by ARC with a goal of helping primary care practices find, understand, and use evidence to improve care. And we've had a focus on the ABCS of heart health, that is aspirin for those at high risk, blood pressure control, cholesterol management, and smoking cessation. Our grantees are also working with practices to help them build their capacity to receive and incorporate into care future patient-centered outcomes research findings, or what we call PCOR findings. Ultimately, we're studying how external support, such as practice facilitation and other QI services, can help practices and the patients they serve in the hopes of creating a blueprint for what works for transformation. Next slide. 
This is the buy the numbers slide. I won't linger on it, but to say that we're investing a good chunk of money at $100 million or more to establish seven cooperatives, to fund an independent external evaluator, and to create a technical assistance center to work with both the grantees and ARC, all to maximize our efforts. And I have to say kudos to the cooperatives who did outstanding work. They've recruited over 1,500 primary care practices with approximately 5,000 primary care clinicians, all that serve some 8 million patients in 12 states around the country. And if you go to the next slide, you can see those 12 states and the locations of the seven cooperatives, the national evaluation team, which we call Escalates, and the technical assistance center. Uh, there's a nice list there of the uh, cooperatives and their states they're working in. I'm not going to go through them now, but um, uh, since this webinar is recorded, you can always go back and look at the slides. So next slide. All of the cooperatives are using multi-component interventions with primary care practices to provide quality improvement support. Generally, they're providing some combination of the QI services shown here, and those are on-site practice facilitation and coaching, subject of today's um, webinar, health information technology support, which actually was the subject of last year's public webinar, shared learning collaboratives, expert consultation, which many in the field know as academic detailing, and of course, data feedback and benchmarking. Next slide, please, Gabrielle. Because it's a research study, as well as an implementation project, we have three groups of metrics we're collecting to evaluate the effectiveness of the interventions, and they are the rate of ABCS delivery in the practice, the practice's capacity for change and adaptation, and we're doing a qualitative and quantitative evaluation of how the intervention was implemented. Next slide, please. Here's where we are time-wise. Um, the project is moving along, and I'd say it's mostly on track. Uh, extraordinary efforts by the cooperative and Escalates and the TAC to get us to where we are today. We're deep into the intervention phase and across several of the cooperatives. Some of the practices in the study have already finished the intervention and are in the sustainability phase. Next slide, please. An exciting thing that happened over the past year since we last talked with you, um, we do have baseline data for many of the practices before they started the intervention. The cooperatives collected this data as practices enrolled in the study, and then they send it along to the national evaluation team who collates it, and then the national evaluation team shared a summary of the data with us. Together with the TAC, we put together an infographic back in February, Heart Health Month, uh, that summarized the baseline ABCS data. There's a link to the infographic at the bottom of the slide, and it will provide much more detail. But in summary, our grantees found that about 65% of patients eligible for aspirin were receiving it. About 62% of patients with hypertension had their blood pressure under control. 57% of patients at risk were receiving statin therapy. And 63% of appropriate patients were receiving tobacco screening cessation counseling interventions. The practice level data uh, will take a lot more time to explain, so I really won't say much about it today, but you can get a hint of it by looking at the curves in the lower right-hand corner of the graphic. It helps if you squint a little bit. Um, I'll summarize it by saying that some practices were providing excellent care with over 80% or more of patients receiving the appropriate ABCS service. Cooperatives are also working with practices that have tremendous opportunities to improve. Those would be the practices on the left side of those curves, either in their care delivery or their documentation of it, or both. And that's really what evidence now is designed to do. It's to help practices reach their goals for improving care. Next slide, please, Gabrielle. At ARC, we believe the secret ingredient for helping practices make the substantive um, and meaningful changes necessary to improve care is practice facilitation. Not only does practice facilitation have an effect on practice in its own right, but it can serve to coordinate and integrate those other QI services. I've shown them to you here again, but this time they're all arrayed around the practice facilitator. Next slide, please. What's the practice facilitator, you ask? Uh, well, I suspect many of you know. Actually, we are fortunate enough to have three of them on the webinar today, which is really exciting for me. Um, on this slide, you'll see a definition proposed by Darren DeWalt and his colleagues back in 2010 based on what they had learned from their work in the Aligning Forces for Quality work. Um, and the, you can see here that practice facilitators are specially trained individuals who work with primary care practices uh, to make meaningful changes designed to improve patients' outcomes. They help physicians and improvement teams develop the skills they need to adapt clinical evidence to the specific circumstance of their practice environment. Definition that really holds up well today. Next slide, please. 
The importance of practice facilitation for primary care transformation has not escaped ARC's attention. We produced our first coaching manual back in 2009 as one strategy to support integration of chronic care into safety net practices. Lindy Knox, who you'll hear from in a few minutes, led or co-led many of these efforts for ARC, including the consensus meeting, the how-to guide, the PF handbook, and the practice facilitation curriculum, which was released in 2015. And frankly, it's no coincidence that the PF curriculum was released just as we were launching Evidence Now. Next slide, please. Okay, that leads us to the third piece of the puzzle that we'll be addressing during today's session, and that is learning healthcare systems. What is a learning healthcare system, you may wonder? Well, we're working on that, uh, but in its simplest form, a learning healthcare system is a feedback loop between practice and research. When health IT finally lives up to its potential, in theory, we'll be able to generate data on what works in real time, find and analyze trends, and then get critical information back to the clinician at the point of care when and where they need it. When systems are in place and policy and incentives align, IT can help create a continuous feedback loop so that we're always learning, and that's the foundation of the learning healthcare system. Next slide, please. How do you know a learning healthcare system when you see one? Well, in a nutshell, and for our purposes today, a learning healthcare system is a healthcare delivery organization that is committed to using both internal and external information over time to improve the care they deliver and the outcomes they attain. ARC believes that organizations that can systematically gather and create evidence and then apply the most promising evidence-based practices to improve care delivery can be called learning healthcare systems. At its best, a learning healthcare system is one which science, informatics, incentives, and culture are aligned for continuous improvement and innovation. With best practices seamlessly embedded in the care process, patients and families active in all elements, and new knowledge captured as an integral byproduct of the care experience. Next slide. So let's try to bring this all together. Evidence Now is about helping practices integrate the best evidence, or what we call knowledge, into practice. Next slide. Practice facilitators are the boots on the ground helping practice identify evidence create the workflows necessary for integration and assist in developing a culture of quality improvement. But it doesn't stop there. Next slide. Practice facilitators are also helping practices better document the care they provide. Not only will this help prepare practices for the quality payment program and other value-based payment programs that are in the future, but data is recorded appropriately and the practice won't be able to, if it's not appro uh, recorded appropriately, uh, practice won't be able to generate an accurate picture of what they're doing well and where to target their improvements. Next slide is finally, practice facilitators can help practices close the feedback loop by helping them find and understand data to generate new knowledge about how the practice is doing and ultimately use that internally generated knowledge in addition to external evidence to guide practice. Next slide. Phew, okay, I'm exhausted. Um, uh, perhaps you are too from listening to me. Uh, but that's a very high level overview of how evidence now and its use of practice facilitation might serve as one model for creating learning healthcare systems. It's not the only model, and I'll leave it open to our speakers to fill in the many gaps I've left open by speaking from their experience with evidence now and other models. These are the folks who are really making this happen. And as we go to the next slide, let me say that I had the pleasure of working with Lindy Knox on the practice facilitation curriculum, and I'm just so thrilled that she could join us today. Lindy, thanks for being here, and I'm gonna hand the webinar off to you. Thank you, Bob. That was actually, I love your vision and I love those, um, the way you're explaining the connection between the knowledge and the research and the transfer into the practice. Um, I want to thank first Bob McNellis, who we've worked together for a number of years on building this, what I believe to be a, a new field of practice facilitators, and also David Myers, who's been a real visionary in this area, and to Judith Schaefer and her team, who's done a great job pulling this all together. What I want to talk to you all a little bit today is about some work that my organization, LANET, is doing in Los Angeles. Um, we're working on a project funded by CMS. It's a practice transformation initiative, very similar to Evidence Now. And it's, what I'm going to be talking about is learning and the role of practice facilitators in a large system like the LA County system. It's the second largest municipal health system in the country. 
um, with thousands of providers and then hundreds of thousands of patients. We have a team of 11 coaches. Um, CMS prefers the term coach to facilitator. I still very much impartial to facilitator because of the kind of top-down connotation that many providers feel when you talk about coaching. Um, but we have a team of 11 practice facilitators that are supporting 11 clusters of practices across the DHS system. So if you could turn to the next slide, please. And I want to talk a little bit about where we have found practice facilitators plugging in. And I think this is true in a, it could be in a federally qualified health center, it could be true um, even in an independent practice, a group practice as well as DHS, so I don't think that this is exclusive to just the large health system. But what we have at DHS and then in many of the other places I've worked in LA is you have your system leadership, and then they have set up a group of issue-specific improvement committees across the system, um, dealing with things like management of poorly controlled diabetics or how do we do better on BMI management, um, the opiate abuse, um, and overprescribing issue is another committee. So there's many, many, there's about 30 across the system. And then there's also site specific. So this is practice level or um, ambulatory care network groups of practices in a, in a shared geography where the medical directors get together with their QI folks and work on improvements specific to those sites. And then this development of improvements, innovations, they're responding very much to a pay for performance model now with um, CMS's prime program. It's pushed down to the site directors, the medical directors, the nursing directors at each of the clusters or the practices, and then needs to be pushed out to the frontline providers and staff. And the system at DHS is really very impressive and working very well from system to the issue and site specific to the site directors. But where we found a gap was getting from the site directors, the medical directors at the sites, the practice level to the frontline practitioners and their staff. And so next slide, please. And this is really where we found that the practice facilitators plugged into this already pretty robust QI infrastructure that they had at DHS. So what we were finding, and it's very similar to even what you saw with the learning collaboratives where clinicians would go off, they would learn these wonderful things, they would come back to their practice, but they just didn't have the human bandwidth to translate that knowledge, that learning that they had acquired at the collaborative meetings back into practice because they were just too busy, the crush of patient care overwhelmed them. Um, and so it's not different at DHS, and so those medical directors or site directors are not able oftentimes to push out um, these improved practices to their frontline practitioners. And so we found that the practice facilitators step beautifully into that gap, and they provide things like the performance data reports, the audit and feedback, academic detailing, and I'll talk a little bit about how we view that slightly differently now than it's classically viewed celebrating improvements, which is a huge part of practice facilitation, is creating that positive culture. And then feedback to leadership, which that missing loop back up to the very top levels of the system of the reality. A lot of quality improvement is very mundane. It's, gee, if I click on this, it doesn't populate, you know, my health maintenance record and I don't get credit, or the alert isn't generated. It's very, very mundane, in the weeds types of activity. And our practice facilitators are becoming experts at that type of work. Next slide, please. So when Bob and Judith and Anne and Stephanie and I were talking about this whole idea of practice facilitators helping a system learn and what is their role, I started thinking about what our facilitators are doing within DHS and what they do with the federally qualified health centers and also what they do with the small independent practices that we support. And to me, it broke down into four boxes. And one is that gathering of information from and for the system. The second is they're able to organize this information so it's actionable and disseminate. In many instances where I've worked like we did a wonderful project with the VA system a number of years ago. They had enormous data resources, but we actually drowned in data. 
um, it wasn't usable because there was just too much. And so the facilitators have become very good at curating that data and then presenting it in a way that inspires action by the, both the medical directors and the frontline providers. The third area is reflecting on this data and designing changes. So it's one thing to receive data, but if you don't interact and reflect on that data, basically learn from it, be thoughtful about it, then it's not that useful. It's a graph that sits up on your wall. And so how do you translate it from that data wall down to real everyday action? That requires time. And what we found that the facilitators are really good at doing is I used to refer to the work I do as I'm a human bookmark. I show up and everybody stops for, you know, even 10 minutes, and that provides a space for reflection. Um, so our facilitators have become very good at doing that as well. And then finally, they provide the traditional support of helping the staff implement and test these changes and then ultimately sustain them through either PDSA cycles or we do a lot of project management, very small project management for the care teams and different clinics within the system. Next slide, please. So I just wanted to drill down a little bit into what each one of these boxes contain for us in Los Angeles and at LANET. And so with the gathering of information from the system to help that system learn, to help the providers learn, to help the medical directors learn, um, one of the things that we found, we have great data through DHS. Again, we drowned in that data, so we, one of our director, Tyler Cito, who's brilliant, has been able to curate a really nice data set for us, and they're getting ready to go live with a new um, healthy analytics program where each provider will actually be able to generate their own performance dashboards. But right now what we're doing is um, also doing hand abstractions for each provider that is lower performing and high volume. And we found that these hand abstractions are very effective because there's a lot of pushback on is this data actually valid? What patients go into um, my metric? And we're actually able to show them that. Um, we also are doing surveys about patient experience. We do key informant interviews. And then the thing that I have found the most valuable is the water cooler conversations and then this just direct observation. Some people would call them a Kaizen walk. But where you're just out on the floor and you're hearing what people are saying, you're seeing what's happening real time, and you as a facilitator can then begin to craft interventions that perhaps nobody, even in that leadership hierarchy I just showed you, has thought about because it's just very in the weeds. And then the other piece of information that oftentimes gets forgotten because QI, oftentimes you go from a deficit model, what's broken, let's fix it. But really one of the most powerful things our facilitators do is continuously scan for people that are succeeding. And talking about that, not letting that get forgotten in the QI meetings, pointing that out in the data reports. We now have a performance report that highlights the top three performers on any metric. And what we found is that that's engendering positive competition, that the providers that see that now want to be one of those three. And that stimulates them more than feeling like they're, I call it ping the duck, the last one. Um, next slide, please. So in this second box of organizing the information so it's actionable and can be disseminated, we do aggregate reports at the practice level, we do them at the system level, and then at the individual level. And what we found really moves the needle is the individual level reports. Providers need to be able to see themselves in comparison both to the benchmark that we're aiming for, but also compared to others. We send these out by email. Um, we also have data walls in the hallways, and then there's group presentations. And then we've developed self-driving pivot tables that the providers can develop their own performance reports for their care teams. But what we found is there's two buckets. There's the group of providers that will do this, um, that are very driven by data, very interested in, and there's folks that just simply are never going to do it. And those are the ones that the facilitators need to produce and provide those reports to. So one thing is knowing your audience and not having unrealistic expectations. We have the ideal model where we're building capacity, where eventually this gets handed off to someone within the system, but there are certain tasks right now that you just can't hand off or the engine stops. And in this case, there's a certain set of providers that simply are never going to produce their own reports, and their team backing them up is just not in that headspace yet. Next slide, please. 
So the third one is um, creating opportunities for reflecting on data. I think this is one of the most important things that our facilitators are doing now. And Anne Lefebvre actually is the one that introduced me to the idea of powerful questioning, um, to that vocabulary, that concept. I'm a clinical psychotherapist by training, and so my entire career has really been about asking good questions. Um, and one of the things that our facilitators learn to do is ask good questions. And what's very nice about that is it's non-confrontational. It's something that also helps people begin to reflect and learn from the data on their own rather than us interpreting it and feeding it back to them. Um, and then the other thing that's really helped get the providers to and the medical directors to reflect on the data is to point out those exemplar practices and begin to ask, I wonder how they're accomplishing that. Let's go study it, find it out, spread it, a form of research and then dissemination within our own system. We set up time and space for presentations in director and QI meetings and then also the one-on-one -on -one meetings. And what we found is with most of the providers, the one-on-one -on -one meetings or the care team meetings are the most effective level, that kind of very personalized hands-on level. Because we have a limited number of, of facilitators, we triage the folks that we're doing one-on-one -on -one with. And those again are, we look at our data and we find our high volume providers who are performing lower than um, expected on that metric. Next slide, please. So the fourth box is the um, implementing and testing changes in practice and, and helping to sustain them. And the way that we do this is academic detailing, and that's something that Mike Fisher and Jerry Avorn from NARCAD had introduced me to and Jim Mould years ago, and we typically thought of it as a clinician to clinician type of training, but they have expanded that concept now, and they deeply train non-clinicians to go out and provide um, evidence on everything from prescribing to workflow around, for example, BMI. And we are using that expanded concept of academic detailing to really enable us to provide standardized training across all 11 facilitators across all of the cluster sites. And what we're finding is by developing those academic detailing training modules, now CMAs, who's the main target of our training, are actually taking it up and training other CMAs. And residents are starting to train other residents because we have this nicely packaged academic detailing training. Um, we do real-time audit and feedback, which is enormously powerful. Um, and then the other way that we're helping to implement and test and sustain the changes is to provide direct feedback. And I do this in weekly meetings with Tyler Cito, who's on the upper level leadership. And they're, again, very mundane things, like this is broken in our ORCID system, or um, we don't have resources for this at this site. Uh, and then he's able to close that loop and make it happen at the, at the leadership level. Next slide, please. And the final thing that's new to me, um, and it's really a habit I had gotten into when I was working with ARC on some of these other projects, is really to create a durable organizational memory and knowledge base for the future. So we're going to be gone in two years. Um, we will have developed and helped build some capacity within the system, but there needs to be artifacts that are left behind that create an organizational memory about what was learned in this experience. So what we're actively doing right now is developing new training modules for their employee onboarding process at the county. Um, we're talking with leadership about incorporating some of this QI and some of the performance on the metrics into evaluation. We've developed a set of newsletters that are aimed at the providers and the medical directors that describe progress and the academic detailing modules so that they can use that and train their own staff on it when we're gone. Um, we've developed repeatable performance report templates that can be used over and over again. And then one of the things that we've been using a lot, it has taken the place for us of listservs, is a, a product called Slack. And it's like an organized kind of texting email app and what that's allowed us to do is to create daily archives of the chatter between our facilitators as they're out in the field. And then we go through and catalog that information and any kind of resources that they've posted or new knowledge that they've unearthed at their site um, so that that can be accessed later by other facilitators, but also by the medical directors and leadership. So next slide, please. So I'm running a little short on time, but I just wanted to show you quickly how this played out for us in, um, in a real kind of facilitation initiative at county. We were working on improving screening for BMI and then follow up with patients that fell outside normal limits. And we were able to go from about a 10% um, performance up to over 80% with the pro providers we were working with. 
Um, we gathered the information through hand audits, through observing their workflows. One of the things that leadership was doing was passing down uh, recommended changes in practice, but not the workflows that helped actualize those changes in day-to-day -day practice. And so we actually went out and mapped exemplar workflows and disseminated those. We also addressed motivation issues. Providers were, you know, not excited about complying with click the box, yes, we did a BMI, because they felt like this doesn't make a difference in our patient's care. We want to do something that really matters. So we started talking about level one QI, which is the click the box, got to do it to get your pay for performance. But the level two, which is let's do something that really blows the top off of great care for your patients. And so now we've got a lot of energy into partnerships with the local YMCA, a new Weight Watchers program that one of the health plans is offering for free, LA Care, to their members. And that has gotten our providers very excited about QI because it impacts not just level one, but level two. Um, we disseminated the information with data walls. We found our exemplars. We reviewed these reports mainly one-on-one -on -one with our providers. And then with the implementation and testing, we focused predominantly on the CMAs because they supported multiple providers. And much of our QI work is really at the CMA and RN level because they control much of those key workflows. So with that, I'm going to pass the baton now to Anne, um, who will talk to us about her fabulous experience in North Carolina. Um, she is one of the places I look whenever I need a really good idea or when I'm stuck. So Anne, take it away. Thanks, Lindy. Um, great examples of um, practice facilitation. So um, I'm going to talk today a little bit about um, how we do things here in North Carolina, but I think that they're, they translate pretty well to all the programs um, that I'm aware of. So next slide, please. So really, the concept of practice facilitation um, is, is really to help build these learning environments within practices and within healthcare systems. Um, and I think it's important that when an organization brings in a practice facilitator from the outside, that they really do use them to teach models and techniques like the model for improvement or different lean methodologies and those types of things that they really come in as an educational resource for that practice, but not just as in a training sense, but truly to model that for them and to get them using those um, PDSA cycles over time so that they're really documenting their changes and really looking at their data. Um, the other thing a practice facilitator can do is really help a practice use the whole team. Um, use of the whole team creates more sustainable change. Um, a practice facilitator can, can look across the practice and say, you know, I think Betty from the front desk will have some really great insights and opinions into this, and I think that the practice facilitator can start to look at your whole team um, and really look to see how you're managing and, and using those throughout your practices because they've come from a whole world of different practices and, and using that to, to build out your team and create sustainable change. And then, of course, using that practice facilitator to help practices to not just pull data, but to value data and understand all different types of data that are needed for QI um, efforts. So keep in mind, a lot of data comes from electronic health record, but somewhat what Lindy was talking about too, not all data has to come from electronic health records. There's an enormous amount of data re, um, available within practices, and I think practice facilitators can help everyone keep that in mind, that sometimes to measure change, the data you need may be right in front of you and not necessarily in a technical specification in a report that's pulled out of your electronic health record. Although at times, that technically specified data out of your EHR is very necessary for quality improvement, and I think understanding it, understanding where it comes from and how it's pulled is another resource um, that the practice facilitator can provide, because in order to be a real learning health system, um, you have to really understand the data that you're relying upon to indicate whether your changes were an improvement. Next slide. So here in North Carolina, and I know in other places across the country, um, we rely heavily on Mary Beth O'Neill's responsibility model. Um, I love her book, Executive Coaching with Backbone and Heart, and, and we've really taken this process here in North Carolina very seriously to understand that while we may coach this practice, while I may be your practice facilitator today, the challenge that this practice is facing um, is owned by the practice. 
Um, the coach does not own the challenge. And again, the more that the practice can understand that the coach is here to facilitate um, that approach to that challenge, that the coach can bring in a whole bunch of different resources and those types of things, that the challenge belongs to the practice, this will help get at what Lindy was talking about in really building that capacity, making sure that you really are a learning health system um, and that that practice facilitator is able to kind of walk you through and help you learn that process. But the challenges you face, the obstacles you are trying to overcome, um, and then also the successes that you're having um, all belong to the practice. Um, and not to the facilitator. Next slide. So this is a model that um, I've worked hard on with um, my colleagues, Neil Baker and Corey Seven, um, starting with a project that we worked on for um, IHI, the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, and we have fully embedded this into our program here in North Carolina. And it's just a model um, for the conceptualization of how a practice facilitator or a practice coach um, can work within a practice or within a health system. Basically the model, um, as I think all good models are easy to understand and hard to implement, and I think this one goes to play with that. Um, the left-hand side of this model, at the circles on the top, um, really go forward. This is not necessarily linear, um, but these are the different types of implementation models that a practice facilitator has at their disposal. Okay, at any time during working with a practice, a coach can go in and actually do things for the team. They can facilitate change. They can consult, meaning they're going to provide an expert opinion. Um, and, you know, have you seen this done before? Yes, I have. This is how this practice did it. And, you know, you can decide if you want to do it that way. Um, they also can provide trainings. One of the things that we're often asked for is to provide a training on how to take a good blood pressure. Um, those are things that we can do or we can provide the resources for. Um, and then all the way over to the right is coaching, which um, in my opinion is a little more sophisticated. Um, coaching someone how to do something is much different than facilitating it being done. And it's certainly much different than doing it yourself. Um, and so I think at their disposal at any time, a practice facilitator has these different modes to go to, and it probably is very situational as to what the practice needs at the time. If you're building rapport in a practice, and that practice needs to start to trust your skills as a practice facilitator, well, then you might actually need to get in there elbow to elbow with them and help them do something. Or you might try facilitating a meeting for them to show them how it's done and those types of things. But keep in mind, if you're doing those types of activities as a practice facilitator or if you're a practice and that's how you're using that practice facilitator, you're really working more towards the left side of this model, which is much more what I would call project-oriented um, or just looking to get the work done, not necessarily looking to really build into that learning health system. Those activities towards the right side of this model are more empowering to the practice. They work harder to build capacity for the practice. If I can coach a practice manager on how to facilitate a meeting and then that practice manager actually facilitates that meeting, um, that's a much more empowering activity and at that point I'm leaving behind my knowledge and expertise and I've built capacity in that practice for that practice to go forward with that. So again, very basic model, but I do think it's something and we've received feedback from our practice facilitators here in our program saying that this is a model that, of course, they all know, but I think using it to remind themselves and to choose that implementation style when they go into a practice today, because otherwise you're going to inherently um, default to one of these methods today. You're going to pick one, whether you do it um, explicitly by what the practice needs or whether you do it default by what suits your personality, you will be um, choosing some, one of these circles today. So as a practice facilitator, to think specifically about what is it that you're trying to do, how can you build capacity in that practice, um, and then choosing your delivery model from that, um, we find moves the coach further in working with their practice. You'll notice that I use the term practice coach and practice facilitator interchangeably because that's what we do here. Next slide. 
So I just have a couple examples of a poor use, and then of course I have a good use of a practice facilitator. Just some things to keep in mind um, if you're in a practice or a healthcare organization out there that's looking to pull in a practice facilitator. Um, one of our experiences was um, when we had a very small public health department in a very rural area in our state. So that's a critical practice. That's somebody that not only do we want to help them improve, but we need to help them survive. We need that practice. We need all of these practices in North Carolina. And so with this practice, um, they had three staff total, and then we provided them with a practice facilitator to take on some improvement activities. Um, they were focusing on diabetes. Um, after them using the practice coach for a while, um, I learned um, through our coach um, and through some discussion with um, our coach and the practice that this practice was mainly using this coach to pull data, run reports, organize meetings, and update their improvement efforts on their bulletin boards in their break room. Now, this may not be a bad way to start out with a practice. This might be a great way for a coach to come into a practice and start out and get them motivated and do these things. But after a longer period of time, this is still what the coach was doing for this practice. Um, when I interviewed our coach or our practice facilitator and talked about, well, why are we still doing these things for the practice? So we're actually doing for the practice at this point. The coach cited that this practice had, practice had constant turnover. Keep in mind they only have three staff. That they had constant turnover and so she was having to retrain the staff all the time and as new staff come in there's a lot of other things in a practice that they have to learn in addition to what our practice facilitator might want to train them on. And so then the coach after some discussions and, and work on this, the, our coach um, that is the external coach for this program realized that she really had fallen into a rut with doing the work herself and she really identified that it was probably more out of frustration than anything else, that it was just easier and quicker for her to go into this practice and run these reports and, and help them with their meetings. She wanted so badly for them to improve, um, but we lost sight a little bit, as did the practice, that she was supposed to be building capacity and not adding another layer of staffing to that clinic. So that's a poor use of a practice facilitator. I think the next slide will show us how a practice facilitator can be used in a much more effective way to really build capacity in a clinic. So this is an example of a rural health clinic, um, of a rural federally qualified health center. Um, they had seven sites, and then one of those clinic sites is also their um, corporate offices. And so at first, this practice facilitator from our program, which is an external practice facilitator for them, um, would go in and meet with their leadership. Um, and would establish goals and a timeline for the work together in all seven of their sites. Um, their leadership, their corporate leadership, would then introduce our practice facilitator um, to the QI team leads, which is what they had, at each one of their sites. Um, and then together, they would develop these team leads for each site and the practice facilitator would develop a rollout plan for how would the practice facilitator come out and work with these practices. Um, the data for this organization is pulled centrally, and each practice site has access to their own data, and they're transparent, so they have access to see the, uh, the data at the other sites for other providers as well, which is a really effective way um, to help practices um, move further along in their quality improvement efforts. Um, with this instance, the practice facilitator would meet individually with each site every two weeks where they would go in with the sites, um, with the QI teams in each site and work with them. They would review data with them, look at their PDSA cycles, what changes do they want to progress and, and add to, what changes um, or PDSA cycles failed and they want to ditch and move to something new, what changes were they making that were having a strong impact. Um, on, their, on their data as they moved forward. Um, and then because that practice facilitator is going into those individual sites, that practice facilitator as well as the leadership can spread some of that knowledge of what's happening and what's working in some of those sites throughout the organization. The practice facilitator would meet with the QI lead at each, at the QI team lead at each one of these sites prior to the QI meeting so that the, the practice facilitator was not running these meetings, but the QI team lead was, and they could agree on what needed to be the focus of that meeting. 
Um, in this case, the coach may attend all of the meetings and consult or help facilitate some of the discussions, but the QI lead runs the meeting and owns the QI projects that are going on. And so the practice facilitator is really just there as a support mechanism um, and a resource to bring in information to, this, to these practices. Um, that coach um, can not only bring in tools and resources from the other practices within this organization, but also from hundreds of practices around the state that we work it with so that they're not limited to learning only from their own sites, but they actually can learn from all different sites across our state and in some cases across the country because a lot of us work together in different states. So it's just an example of how an organization can make the best use of a practice facilitator. Um, it's not intended to you know, be an additional member of your staff. It's intended to come in and be a, a resource. Um, it's very much in the teach them how to fish um, category of, of learning. Of really, we are there to just provide them with as much knowledge and resources as we have so they can build their own strong programs and really see some sustainable change. So I'm going to turn it over to Stephanie Kircher now from um, Colorado. And Co Stephanie's going to talk to us about the things that are needed in addition to practice facilitators to really make this work in your organization. Stephanie? Thanks, Anne. Um, you can go ahead to the next slide. So I'm going to um, talk today about two elements of what I think define um, in successful learning healthcare systems, being engaged leadership and really high utilization of practice teams, how they go hand in hand and how the practice facilitator role really supports them in practice and how um, we as facilitators can bring out the best in the practices that we support and interact with through programs like Evidence Now. So, in terms of, um, of vision, I think this is an element of work or of the work with quality improvement that's so essential that leaders and practices and the teams that they lead understand the big vision, the big picture of where they're going with work um, related to quality improvement. What we see often as practice facilitators is those with that vision who often sign up um, and engage in initiatives like Evidence Now um, are not always the people on the ground who are going to figure out ways to translate this into practice. And I think that's a huge place where practice facilitators come into play. Um, we can help a, um, a clinician who excuse me, isn't as familiar with the goals of Evidence Now, understand what, um, what these initiatives really entail and kind of think, help them think of the steps to get um, from, from A to Z and working through um, really improving outcomes for their patients. So I think what the practice facilitator does in this role is really trying to understand at a practice level what's important to them. I think globally, most clinicians would agree that they want to improve cardiovascular outcomes or whatever project that they're focusing on, but trying to understand exactly how to get there um, and how to motivate their teams to understand their vision in that work is something that often doesn't come as naturally. Um, so we spend time in practices um, helping um, communicate that vision to quality improvement teams and other people in the practice who help actually get the work done. Um, so one of the, I, I mean, there's so many stories in the field of, of trying to figure out how to um, get practices moving forward, and I think um, really this communication piece is so elemental. So how do you understand exactly where you're headed? And we do things in, that are really kind of on the nose in terms of helping practices um, create vision statements um, and really understand their work together, but then helping them unpack that through PDSA cycles and um, really tangible work that can happen in a practice to get to that vision. Um, you can go to the next slide. So I see the role of the um, practice facilitator very much um, akin to Wayne Gretzky, and my dad would be proud of me for using that as an example of a person who is constantly skating to where the puck is going to be and not where it has been, um, and helping practices to become engaged in their leadership style. Um, many times um, we're faced with practices that are, that are leaning into uh, an environment that's swirling around policy um, changes, the way that they're getting paid, adjusting to the quality payment program, I'm really trying to do the best for their patients, engaging patients and families in the work that they're doing. 
um, but they get overwhelmed and kind of stuck in the moment of, of not being sure where the next step is. And I think practice facilitators can bring in, um, I love that Ian said being a human bookmark. I think this is an example of where we do this again is really kind of helping them think about where things are headed next, and we can kind of help them stay one step ahead of all these changes that, um, that are coming towards them and help them not be so overwhelmed when they're in an environment where they're trying to see 30 patients a day and really just do the best they can to keep afloat. Um, and my, one of my favorite practices um, who has a clinician leader who's always been an early adopter, he, this is a practice that did participate in evidence now, but I can tell you <laughs> they're also a practice that's participated in almost every quality improvement initiative that I've supported over the last 11 years. Um, and um, I think that he needs to always, this, this practice is always trying to kind of get out ahead. And, um, and I think that is a result of the kind of support that they're getting from initiatives like Evidence Now to help them think through be, and being ready to anticipate what's coming towards them next because they have a practice facilitator who kind of comes in and helps them stop and think about the things that they're doing now and how that's going to prepare them for their next challenges. Um, I think it was also, you know, getting back to some of the things that Lindy was saying, that the practice facilitator um, often acts as a liaison in this kind of work um, in translating what is happening at a large system level in terms of strategic goals and moving towards um, new, new payment uh, models and what the practice really needs, helping them be, um, helping the individual practice voice be heard. And I think the practice facilitator spends a lot of time trying to understand how is this meaningful to this one individual practice and really once, once you can kind of get under the hood of that and really understand what excites that group about the work in the larger initiative or the larger, larger strategic vision, is really when you start to get traction in a practice. Um, and sometimes that can, be, um, that can be a medical assistant, it can be a front desk person, it's often um, care coordinators who are trying to think about um, how do I align the work I'm already doing with some of these really strategic um, changes that are coming towards me in, in the healthcare environment. Um, an example of this is the care manager who is also, um, that I know and work with closely, who's also a certified diabetes educator. So she's really kind of focused on that population. And so when you start to think about um, changes in ABCS measures, a real hook for that practice and a real hook for her is thinking about how does this affect my patients with diabetes, who we all know have a higher incidence of having problems with hypertension. And so she's really focused on that subset of patients first, and then you see how it starts to spread when she kind of gets her hands around a smaller subset of patients. Her thinking can expand further because she's feeling less overwhelmed. She has a model that she can replicate with larger groups of patients or other subsets. So it's just a way, I think the practice facilitator just helps kind of find those hooks and simplify things so that people can actually manage the change instead of feeling so overwhelmed. Um, we also have the luxury of coming and going in and out of practices so we can help them, we can help be the human bookmark. I'm gonna use that all the time now, Lindy, um, to help them stop and just think about something small for a period of time and help them protect time to do that so then they can actually start to affect some change as they move forward. Um, next slide. Um, and, this, and this kind of ties um, really, really closely to a team approach to patient care. Um, and the pocket knife is actually something that I'm using. My dad would be very proud of me today. Um, this is a pocket knife my dad gave me when I left for college. It says versatility is life. And I think that this is a good motto for a practice facilitator in trying to kind of um, model um, versatility and flexibility um, that we have to share the workload. We have to be able to pass things off to other team members to help support the greater goal. Um, and that we have to kind of be comfortable with things not always working the first time and picking ourselves up and figuring out what went wrong and how to, um, how to move forward. And I think that's not something that comes naturally to everyone. Um, I think in, in the world of physicians, there's, it's hard to um, sometimes tolerate that things aren't always going to go right the first time. And so when you can break things down into very small tests of change, very tangible things that you can see a change in even within a week sometimes, it doesn't have to be 
changes in A1C measure. It can be things that are much smaller than that. Um, and kind of figure out if it's going to work quickly. And one of my, my leader at the Department of Family Medicine here in Colorado has a um, plaque in his office that says, fail smart, fail fast. Um, and I think that's a great way to approach this kind of work because we're very seldomly going to get it right the first time. Um, and the, and the role here of um, the, the practice facilitator um, can be very subtle um, in trying to get clinicians and teams to be thinking about how they can offload some of the things that they feel that they have to do uniquely. Um, and we do this through process mapping exercises where you can start to see where, um, oh my gosh, the clinician seems to be doing every piece of managing patients with diabetes. Um, where there's some things that um, you can offload and create some protocols and standing orders for other people on the team um, and just kind of softly approaching that through um, an exercise that really kind of speaks to the reality of what's going on in a practice that can help kind of motivate them to consider making some changes that they might have been uncomfortable with. I think it's a process of leading them to self-discovery of the things that they need to change instead of going in and saying, wow, I really see this as a problem as an outsider and you need to fix it. Sometimes leading them um, more softly is a, is a key element of practice facilitation. Um, you can go to the next slide, Gabrielle, thanks. Um, the, I think the, my, favorite, my favorite practice story of using a team well is really a, a clinician that I've worked with over several projects and several years. He was also in Evidence Now practice. Um, but he'll say to me over and over again that the, the primary question is, what are the things that only I, as the physician, can uniquely do for my patients? And I can tell you this is not a place where he was 10 years ago. He felt very strongly that he needed to do everything. He needed to be the answer to everything for his patients. And um, through working on, uh, I think through necessity with so many challenges and so many changes coming towards him as a small practice, a small rural practice, private practice. Um, he was forced to, um, to share some of that, but um, I think working with, um, with projects like Evidence Now that provide some insight from the outside and some support to slow down, to go fast, um, really helped him think about that. And so it always makes me happy when he gets, he always, we always put him on the stage to present, and that's always the critical question he says is, what can, I, what can only I do um, that's unique to me as the MD for my patients? Okay, next slide. I want to make sure I leave a couple of minutes for questions because we've kind of run, we've kind of gotten away with ourselves talking a little bit. But um, we've talked a lot about these challenges and strategies and creating protocols, really clearly defining roles on teams, encouraging care team huddles to improve communication. Um, strong workflow redesign is something we do all the time. Um, and so we're just trying to unpack some of the challenges that practices um, face and help them move through them at a manageable pace. Um, so I can leave it at that, Bob. I don't need to go any further. I want to, I know it's 10.57 by my clock and leave a couple of minutes for um, people to be able to ask some questions. Thanks, Stephanie. I mean, that, that was just fantastic. And, uh, you know, at this point, I was going to do something, but I'm so wrapped up in all you guys were saying. This was really great. And so first, let me just say thank you, Stephanie and Ann and Lindy. Um, uh, really great job. And I love the insights that you're sharing. And this was the point I was going to try to do a little summary of what I had heard, but I've heard so many great things. The human bookmark, I, I made a note of that one, too. And Stephanie, I love your dad. Um, versatility is life. Um, slow down to go fast. Uh, inspire action. I mean, these are all, you guys have great, great things here that I think we can take away. But I'm going to stop there and really, um, you know, Gabrielle, maybe if we can pull up one or two questions um, that we might have had, maybe we can take a moment to answer those um, and uh, and see what you do. But also to, to, to let people know that they can continue to submit questions and, and, and let us know what their thoughts are. So, Gabrielle, I'm going to turn it back over to you. Absolutely. Let's see if we can squeeze in one or two questions here. And while we do that, I'm going to put our presenters' email addresses up on the slide here um, so you all can jot that down or take a screenshot and, um, and share your great questions with them directly, too, if we run out of time here. So um, first, this is a question that uh, all of you guys can weigh in on, but can you just say a few more words about how practice facilitators can engage and influence leadership um, in health systems and in clinics, and, and what kinds of actions, you know, specific actions can they take? Cindy, do we, can we start with you for that one?
or Ann or Stephanie, if you guys are off mute. Sure. This, this I, can, I can step in. I don't mind doing that one. That's a good one. Um, oh, I, sorry, I was on mute. Oh, sorry. sorry. Go ahead, Ann. Stephanie was taking it. Oh, so you know, one of the um, one of the most powerful and yet simple exercises that I can I've done in practices around engaging leadership is really getting the whole team excuse me, at the table for a process mapping exercise. Because when you can start to see, and, and beginning that with the leadership really articulating clearly what they see as an issue, what they would like to see go differently, um, and then really facilitating a process where they, where everybody in that, at the table contributes. Um, because then I think the leaders start to see um, start to see where there are strengths on, uh, from other people on the team and where other people can contribute, and they start to see they don't have to necessarily own everything. But in terms of engaging leadership to get involved in these kinds of things, you know, I hate to say this, but um, if you have somebody who's a leader who's really, really stuck, I think it's often a practice facilitator's best move to try to respectfully move around them. I think you can identify um, informal leaders in practice who can help move the, who move the needle forward, who can really be an advocate and, and start getting the leader's attention by the positive changes that happen. So I don't know, that may seem a little bit you know, a little manipulative, and maybe Ann or Lindy would think differently, but that's something that I definitely have done. No, I think you're right on it, Stephanie. This is Ann in North Carolina, and, and I agree. I think those leaders that are stuck, they don't mean to be, and I think any way that you can help them move forward by moving the clinic forward, I, I don't think is a bad move. Um, again, with respect to their position and their title. So the way that we do it, just to be super laser, is ask a single question is, what are your biggest concerns and worries right now and how can we help? And then the other thing that we do is understand the money flow. It's a bit crass, but we follow the money and understand what those financial drivers are and how they align with um, different quality initiatives we may be funded to push. Great, thank you guys for weighing in on that. And one other very quick question before we wrap up for today. Um, in your experience, what kinds of um, professional backgrounds do practice facilitators have and do they receive any specific trainings? Yeah, so this is Ann, I'll, I'll jump in on that. Um, in North Carolina, um, all of our practice facilitators are in their second careers and so their previous experience in healthcare is a huge support to our practice facilitation program and it brings a lot of experience out there in their practices. It also creates a very diverse team of practice facilitators um, and so we have people with background in healthcare administration, in, in nursing, in public health, um, I'm in social work, <laughs> There's, um, we really do have a, a very rounded set. We have some health information managers, certainly some in health IT, and I think the, the more round you can have as a skill set on your team, um, the, the more backing you have as a pr practice facilitator into a practice. Um, in our program, then we have an extensive training program for our practice facilitators that only picks up on the areas that um, they might be lacking from their previous experience um, or previous career in, in healthcare. Um, and so at that point, we're just kind of raising the tide for all of our practice facilitators. Great, thank you, Ann, that's really helpful. Um, Stephanie, Lindy, anything else on that before we wrap up? No, I think, no, I think Ann covered it. <laughs> Okay, great. Well, folks, that's all the time we have for today. Again, if you have questions that we weren't able to get to, um, please feel free to email them to our, our presenters today. Um, and if you are interested in more information about AHRQ's Evidence Now initiative or additional resources about the information covered in today's webinar, um, please visit ahrq.gov or pcmh.ahrq.gov, as we've listed here a few resources that may be of interest to you. And again, the slides and recording of today's webinar will be made available on the AHRQ website later this month. So with that, this concludes today's webinar. Bob, any last words from you? I, I just need to give thanks to the whole crew. So thank you, Lindy and Ann and Stephanie. Um, I think I'm ready to start a second career as a practice facilitator. It's maybe fifth career. <laughs> well, come fifth on career. to North Carolina, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> Bob, we're hiring out in L.A. I'm back from it. 
<laughs> there you go. If you stayed on the line uh, this late, you know you got job opportunities out there. Um, but I also want to make sure I gave a special thanks to Judith Schaefer, who really pulled this team together and had the vision for the webinar. Thanks, Gabrielle and Anna and all the folks at the TAC for your support. And finally, thanks to all of you who joined us today. Uh, we hope this has been as helpful to you as it has been inspiring for me. And uh, we look forward to our public webinar next year around this time. So thank you all for joining us today. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day. Thank, thank you. you.